we pray with me? Let's invite the Holy Spirit to impact us with His Word. We need Him to impart and impact us with His Word. So, Lord, our Father, we ask now, we open up our hearts, we invite you by your Spirit to impact our hearts with your Word. Plant it like a living seed that lodges deep within us. Let the soil of our hearts be good ground, that the Word may lodge there and may grow and root and become deeply rooted and strong and grow up to produce fruit for your kingdom and for your glory, Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you weren't here last week, this is part two of a message called Why Grace is So Amazing. How many were here last week? How many are glad we're not going over that material again? <laughs> I got a lot of looks like a deer in the headlights a little bit last week. Um, here's the analogy that I use. I, I, I asked the question that if we went up to somebody and asked them, or they asked us rather, why do you Christians say that grace is so amazing? And, and I asked what the answer would be, and I gave what my answer would be. My answer would be two parts. One, part one was because of what I deserved, and part two was because of what I got. See, you have to understand those things together or you don't get the whole picture. And so I asked last week how many have heard a message in the last five years on the justice of God or on the wrath of God, and no hands went up in the whole room. And if I would have gone 10 years and 15 years, there still probably would have been none or very few. But that is the background, and here's the analogy that I use, and I think it's very, um, it, at least it helps me to understand it. When I'm going to a jeweler to buy diamonds, which is twice in my life, when I was getting married and on my 25th anniversary, okay? Is that good? Is that points? All right. So we went to the jeweler. The first thing that he does, at least when we were there, he takes out this black velvet pad, and then he pulls the diamonds out. And then he shows them in the light against the background of that black velvet pad so that you can appreciate the beauty and the nuances of that diamond and see the facets of it. Okay. Have to have the background to see it. Same thing's true with the gospel. If we don't see the background of the justice of God and what we actually deserve, we can't see the beauty of the diamond. We would feel entitled. I think there's a, there's a huge spirit of entitlement in our generation, in our society. It was even when, in my generation, but it's even escalated and, and, and gotten much greater in, in this generation. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. There is a spirit of entitlement that is tremendous. There was um, a survey done among employers in this country not long ago. And they asked the employers, if you had to describe in one word... The employees that are applying for a job that are just college, you know, out of college, graduating college, what would that word be? And overwhelmingly, the word was entitled. Um, they expected that because, after all, it's me, I deserve the highest pay, the greatest benefits, and, and all these other things. And, and there's, a, there's a brainwashing that's going on in our society. So my, my concern is not so much with that, but my concern is with that uh, attitude of entitlement that is in the church, I think that it keeps us from seeing and recognizing the great beauty and glory of the gospel of grace. We kind of feel entitled to God loving us, because of course God loves me. Of course He's going to bless me. But if we see it in the light of His justice, it's not at all obvious that we should be forgiven. It's not at all obvious that we should be blessed. What is patently obvious is that we should be judged eternally, and that would be just and right. That's the ground we covered last week. That's not popular ground to preach. But apart from seeing that, we don't see the gospel. That is the gospel. Here you were without hope and without help and without God in the world. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were bound by the enemy. You did his will. You indulged the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You were by nature children of wrath even as the others. Do you agree the scripture says those things? That's the background. And without seeing that background, you can't see the glory of Jesus coming and taking our place, taking the punishment that we do, were due, and connecting us with himself. That's the glory and the beauty and the power of the gospel. I will tell you something. I was telling Jeremiah the other day. This seems crazy. 
But this understanding that in the last 20 years of my life, really, really understanding it, has brought more joy to my life than I think anything else of my understanding of, of, of the truth of God. Entitled mindset is the enemy of your joy in God. It's so freeing to know that you deserve nothing. Because when you really realize that you deserve absolutely nothing from God. See, grace is what we talk about, undeserved. What that means is grace, everything that we receive from God, we deserve absolutely none of it. That, that, that's grace, right? There's no such thing as deserved grace. That's a, that's a contradiction in terms. It has brought such joy to my heart to realize, Lord, I don't deserve anything. So everything that you give me... I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. Instead of feeling entitled and bored, you know, the, the, the most miserable kids that I knew growing up were, were the rich kids. They had everything. They had all the electronics. They had the pool. They had the pool table. Had, and they were bored and they were miserable. They weren't happy. They were entitled because they were always thinking that there was somebody else across the world that had something that they didn't have. Here's, here's what I want to start at before we get into this verse. People who understand grace, truly understand it, are the most grateful people in the world. The beginning point in understanding grace is to see that we deserve absolutely nothing from God. That's the beginning point of understanding grace. Our gratefulness is the best measure of our understanding of grace. Our gratefulness is the greatest and best measure of our understanding of grace. So, if, if we're not a grateful people, that tells me that we don't understand the grace of God. When we understand that the penalty that was due to me, I used the example last week, I, I came to the Lord when He was drawing me when I was 15 years old. And... He just began to suddenly draw me. I didn't go to church. I hadn't heard the gospel. I had never read the Bible. I didn't even own a Bible for like at least a year after this experience. I didn't go to church. Um, God just was suddenly drawing me out of my lifestyle of sin. I don't know where I was going with that, but I'll pick it up. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Uh, oh, I get, okay, here's where I was. I was using this as example. So, seeing the justice of God. When I was 15 years old, I picture myself before the judgment seat of God. Him looking at my life, and, and you would see me like a little bird with a broken wing, and you'd feel sorry for me. And you'd say, God, help him. He's, he's a cute little guy. He's broken. You see, he's been on drugs. He's been all messed up in all kinds of things, and he's crying out to you for help. And, and, and what I said was, Taking God's standard of justice when I'm standing before him. If I looked at the Old Testament law, there were many things that the Father gave as capital offenses in the Old Testament, right? Yeah. Blasphemy, idolatry, cursing your parents, sexual um, perversion, breaking the Sabbath. So I look at that list and I'm a 15-year-old boy and I see that I've, I've done at least three or four of those things that were worthy of death in God's eyes. So I'm standing here before God. And he said, yeah, I'd like to help you. But uh, my justice cries out. You're worthy of death three or four times over. Yes. I'm in a mess. From your eyes, I look like a little broken boy. Just crying out for help. But under the view of divine justice, I'm dead. And I deserve death. Do you agree that God's view and God's standards and God's law are holy and just and right? And that God is absolutely just and he does not give a punishment that is more than the crime deserves? Yes. You guys agree with that? He's absolutely just. So here I stand. Right? We, don't, we don't see it that way. We don't see from the divine justice. We have this, this curve that we work on. About what our intentions were, and we were really pretty good guys, and the reason I got caught up in all this stuff was because my friend said blah, blah, blah. 
Divine justice is absolutely holy and righteous. And he says, you deserve to die. so much in their own eyes that they cannot see or hate their sin. That was me. That was me all over. I was a good guy. Dude, I wasn't half as bad as some of my friends. But by the standard of God's justice, if I would have stood before God without the blood of Jesus washing my sin, I would have been forever condemned to eternal destruction and it would have been right. Without seeing the background of that, we don't get the gospel. But when I see the background of that, even me, I mean, there's, there's lots of you guys that were wor way worse than me. Who was way worse than me? And a lot of you guys were. Way worse than me. We both would have gone to the same lake of fire. And so when I picture myself before the throne of the judge of all the universe, it makes me want to melt and weep. Yes. Thank you, God. Oh, I had a bad day, Lord. Why did you do that to me? What? <laughs> Lord, how come I didn't get that job that I did? What? Lord, how come I got teased at school? What? You were pardoned from eternal destruction because of the blood of Jesus. That is enough to rejoice over forever. That's the whole point in the book of Hebrews when he's saying these guys are suffering, right? These believers are thinking about turning away from Jesus and turning back. Because they're having a hard time. They even had their property seized, their houses taken, and they were put in jail falsely. How many are all okay with that? If they came and took your house, and they drove you away to jail, they raided your bank account, and you're sitting there in jail, how many are okay with that? You know what the Lord's advice to them was? It's okay. You have a lasting inheritance. Yes. Yes. I know that's, that's hard, isn't it? I, th I think about that sometimes. What if, what if I lost everything? There's times where I felt like I was going to lose everything. This produces such joy. Amen. It puts things in such perspective. Okay, so I suffer for a little while here. Look, I don't even say anything I've experienced in life has been suffering. I just, I just can't hardly do it. I mean, I read about my brothers and sisters around the world yes. and the things that they go through and have gone through. I'm like, no, I'm not worthy to be in the same room with them. Puts things in perspective. Yes. The gospel is the greatest news that has ever, ever been spoken. It's not ho-hum and yawn. If we yawn at the gospel of grace, we don't get it at all. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. God would take a total knucklehead and loser like me and pardon my sins. And say, not only that, I'm going to take you and I'm going to make you my son. I'm going to put you in my house. I'm going to dress you. I'm going to teach you how to live and how to walk and how to act. I'm going to put my spirit inside of you. I'm going to plant my word inside of you. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to give you wisdom so that you can understand how to do relationships. I'm going to do all these things. He didn't have to do any of that. If he would have put me in the shed in the back 40 and said, you go out there and live with the dogs. I, I hate to kill him, but when I want you, I'll call you. Just stay back there. It would have been great mercy. So far. So far different. Here's where I want to go today. 
<laughs> you guys are glad I'm getting off this justice thing, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, stop talking about the black hat underneath the diamond. Okay, we're going to move on. But look, we have to get that in order to see the glory of the diamond. The grace of God in Jesus Christ is the highest revelation of God's glory in the whole universe. And it will be so throughout eternity. It's the, I believe that. It's the highest revelation of God's glory. I hope to show you that here in just Ephesians chapter 1. Do you find that yet? Verse 3. Start reading there. I want to read verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Think about God in the light of what you deserve. Is, is there anyone that deserves good from God ever? Is there anyone, anywhere, that ever deserved, deserved good for God? Jesus. Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteousness is like what? With your eyes. And, and it's even stronger than that in the Hebrew. I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm just going to tell you what the Hebrew word is. It said it's a dirty, used menstrual cloth. That's what the word is. Translators wouldn't feel comfortable putting that in there. But that's what the word is. So graphic. That's all of our good stuff. That's all of our good stuff! blessed us with every spiritual blessing in light of what I deserve. Here's, here's the other part of grace. What I got. My goodness. We hardly have touched this. We hardly have. Brothers and sisters, you love it. We hardly have touched this. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons. It means we have the full legal rights as His heirs through Christ Jesus to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. Hear that heart. To the condemned criminal that deserved nothing but eternal punishment, His heart full of kind. Intention because Jesus was my substitute. He predestined us. Verse 6 to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Notice that phrase, He freely bestowed it upon us. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. I want you to notice the word lavish and that he freely gave. I mean, you, you need to be thinking about not a teaspoon, but Niagara Falls on your head. See, God owed us nothing, absolutely nothing. But he decided to show the greatness of the glory of my heart of love and mercy and grace. I'm going to pour Niagara Falls of blessing and goodness upon these people. Praise They're going to be overwhelmed for out, throughout all of eternity. It doesn't stop in this life. Forgiveness of sins is the doorway. Amen. 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 Niagara Falls is pouring down on you with grace and kindness. His heart is so He lavished on us all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according again to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Verse 12, to that end, that we, I'm sorry, to the end, the goal was that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise 
of his glory. I'm talking about this being the highest revelation of God's glory. Verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So there's something that is revealed of God's glory in this whole plan of redemption that he takes convicted criminals and he pours out upon them the riches of his grace. In chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul says it's the unsearchable, unfathomable riches of Christ that is poured upon us. Think about the contrast here. We covered last week that for a life of rebellion against God, since we were created to show forth His glory and we chose to live our own way and do our own thing, totally contrary to His decrees. The, pun the rightful punishment, the just punishment for that is eternal torment and suffering in the lake of fire. That's the right punishment for that. But what do we get? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We haven't even touched it. Romans chapter 9 I just want to show you this. I'm making the point that this is the highest revelation of God's glory. Verse 22 to 24. <laughs> Romans 9. This is not well-worn territory, but I'm, I'm going there. What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so. Why did he do that? He did so to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. So what is he saying? God bore patiently with those who spit in his face every day. I used to do it before I knew him. I said in essence to God, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you want. I don't care who you are. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what makes me happy. I don't care if it hurts anybody else. I couldn't care less. I love a candy bar more than I love you. That's what I thank God every day of mine. <coughs> you said, I never told the Lord that. Yes, you did. By the way you live. I wouldn't have vocalized it like that, but that's what my life is saying. And he said, watch. Watch what I'll do. I'm going to take that rebellious heart, and I'm going to draw it to myself, and I'm going to put in him a desire to know me and to call out to me for mercy. And when he calls out to me for mercy in the name of Jesus, I'm going to pour it out in my Niagara Falls. I'm going to wash away all that rebellion, all that junk that's inside of him that fills his life. And I'm going to make him clean inside. And I'm going to put my spirit within him. And I'm going to draw him to myself. And I'm going to put my desire for my truth and my word inside of him. And I'm going to keep filling him and building him. And I'm going to take away those broken patterns in his soul where he scarred himself over and over again. And I'm going to redeem him. I'm going to put my name on him. And I'm going to love him and lavish my goodness on him every day of his whole life. And after that, in eternity forever. Yes, Lord. Oh, yeah, grace. Wow. This is amazing. This is amazing. The grace of God is so amazing. He's captured your heart. Do you know what you have? Do you know what you have? So amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Grace from beginning to end the Christian life. You know, Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. At the beginning of every one of the letters, what does he say? Grace and peace. At the end of every one of his letters, what does he say? Grace to you. Grace with you. Why? Because everything in the Christian
Christian life and have. Everything that we have and are is because of the grace of God. Do you know that God is called in the New Testament the God of all grace? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace? Do you know that the gospel is called the word of his grace? And do you know that the throne that he sits on to rule over his people is called the throne of grace? You're under the reign of grace. Grace is reigning over you. I like that. Reign. I totally submit to it. Let the water flow. What are we dealing with here? I think that a lot of us, we're going to get to the time when we die and go and be in the presence of the Lord. And we're going to go, oh my goodness! I settled for a drop! When you provided an ocean! What was I even thinking? I got so distracted with this thing and that trivial thing. And here this ocean of your grace lies before me. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. What in the world? Oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. Right. So I just want to talk. I'm not going to go too long today. Because to talk about, I'm going to talk about the diamond, which is God's grace. I believe it's the highest revelation of his glory and more than <coughs> eternity. Can, are you still in Ephesians? Just read verse 7. Right? Ephesians 2, I'm sorry. Ephesians 2, verse 7. You were in chapter 1 now. Just flip over the page. Chapter 2, verse 7. Let's, let's start verse 6. Let's start verse 5. <laughs> Even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. For by grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, the discovery and the experience of God's grace towards you is never, ever going to stop. It's never going to stop. It's never going to stop. This diamond is so beautifully faceted. There's so many beautiful faces on it. That throughout all of eternity, God's going to still lavish it on you. And you're going to see more and more nuances of how great His grace was throughout eternity. I'd say it's pretty big. I'd say it's huge. <laughs> and, and here's what we have as believers. We have these boundaries that we kind of set. And the Lord says, here's the grace that I poured out upon you and for you. And we want to just say, yeah, well, if I do this and this, these three things and my life is kind of cleaned up, then that's good. Don't believe it. I believe God delights in those who will say, Father, you put an ocean out there? And you didn't tell me how far out I could swim. You just said, here it is. And I think he delights in those who just say, I'm in. I'm diving in. I'm swimming as deep as you'll take me. Let me experience the depths of your grace and your goodness and your kindness to me. I just want to talk about three facets of, of this grace today. These aren't things that you have never heard before. They're just probably things that we've hardly seen before. Even if we've heard them 20 or 50 times. There's power and beauty in the revelation of God's grace. Number one. You can go back to chapter one of Ephesians. I'll just refer to them again. The overwhelming embrace of the Father in your life. This is amazing. What God invites us into is not just to be his servants. He's made us full sons. And he invites us into fellowship the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 9 that we were called into the fellowship of God through Jesus Christ. 
So our calling is to fellowship with God. You say, well, how far can you go? I don't know. How deep is the ocean? There's so much. The calling and the invitation for intimacy through the blood of Jesus, where is the limit to that? I don't know. I know that we're not going to see fully and know fully here. I know that. Right? Because we're going to see him as he is when we see him when he comes again. But how far can I go from where I am to where that place is? I don't know. I think he leaves it open-ended because there's an invitation there saying that I purchased for you an ocean full of grace with my blood. Don't suffer for a job. Just, just don't suffer for a job. Keep on moving. Keep on coming. This grace is amazing and magnificent. Grace is... Here's a definition of grace. Here's my definition of grace. Okay? Grace is the settled state of God's heart. Grace is the settled state of God's heart towards us. To bless us. To be kind to us. And to lift us into our highest destiny and joy. He's already made up his mind about you. Did you know that? You know, God, he already made up his mind. If you're in Christ Jesus, he already made up his mind about you, whether he likes you or not. <laughs> he made up his mind, in fact, before there was even time or creation, because you were chosen in him before there was time. He made up his mind about you already. That no convincing is needed. He, he likes you. <laughs> you're in his son. And he loves his son. And you're in him. One writer says that all the focus of the divine affection is upon Jesus. And we're in him. We're in him. You, you remember in Numbers chapter 6, the blessing, the Lord told Moses, he said, tell Aaron and his sons, the priests, to speak this blessing over my people. Right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with peace. You, you notice in that phrase that the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. That phrase in the Hebrew talking about God's face shining upon us, that's his smile. That means his attention is on you. And that means that his inclination of his heart towards you is to bless you. And you read through the prophets in the Old Testament. And you read in some of the Psalms. And they use that same phrase. God's face. And when they sinned. And when they committed idolatry. His face turned away from them. And when his face turned away from them. It wasn't good. They went into judgment. They got into problems. They wasn't a good time. But you know, there, there's a prophecy in the end of Ezekiel 39 that I love. I just come to love it. I was reading through, I, I mentioned this before, but I was reading through Ezekiel in chapter 39, the last verse, verse 29. But I'm reading through there, and this is a time where it's talking about the Lord's face turned away from them. And so their enemies came in and boom, 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 they're going into judgment, they're going into captivity, one thing after another. It's not good. And then the Lord's heart pops up on that last verse of Ezekiel 39. And he says, when I will pour my spirit upon my people. Talking about when the church is born at Pentecost. Then I will never, never, never again turn away my face from them. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Your face. It's on me. This is one of the most important needs for, for you in your life. Is to realize that you're living as a believer under the smile of the Father. And not under His hand. You, you see the huge disparity between what was deserved and what was gotten? I mean, this is, this is outlandish. He took those who were his enemies and he said, you know what? I'm going to marry you. What? No, I'm going to make you into
to my bride and make you like me, and, and we're going to be together forever like a husband and wife. Your enemy will hate you. This is crazy. This is the display of God's glory, of the glory of his great heart, to take a bunch of rebels and losers and make them into a bride for his son that will be one day. So I can have a hard day or a hard week at work or a hard life. It pales in comparison to what I'm talking about. I was praying one time when I thought I was going to lose my business and everything else. And it was a terrible time. Horrible time. Broke and poor and depressed and got a letter from a guy saying he was going to shoot us next time he saw us out there. And, no, I'm not kidding. He sent a carbon copy to his cousin who was the sheriff of that county. And I was out praying to the Lord. I just held up the letter. I said, God, you see this? Man, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this anymore. And I just began to pray. I don't know if you've ever had this experience but I just began to pray and just pray. I didn't know what else to do. Just pray in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon me and started prophesying to myself. <laughs> and the message was something like this. Even if you lose everything else, you've still got everything. Wow. Don't fear. Don't fear. You can't lose the things that are valuable. You can't lose your inheritance. You can't lose the diamond.
that everything that touches your life, he will use it for your good. Yeah. Everything that he brings into your life, he will use it to bless you. It's not to hurt you. It's to bless you. The settled state of his heart towards us to bless us, be kind, lift us into our highest destiny in joy. John chapter 1. You don't have to go there if you don't want to. It's verses 14 through 17. I think that's up. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. What's the next word? What's the word? F-U-L-L. Full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I have already existed before me. For out of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. This is just an interesting phrase, and this has rocked me for a while. But grace upon grace has this idea of grace instead of grace. And so you tell, what, what are you talking about? It's like the waves of the ocean. Grace comes in, and then another wave comes in, and then another wave comes in, and then another wave comes in. And so the grace of God towards you is moving. It's moving. It's always coming with another wave of His grace. It doesn't run out. It's not like we received grace when we came to Jesus and that was the end of that supply. Ha! Not at all. There's a never ending supply of grace upon our lives. It's an outflow from His heart, it's an outflow from the Father's heart. All right, that's point one is overwhelming embrace of the Father. It, it, this is so key. Let me just say it again. I just feel like, I just feel stuck on this for a minute. Is that okay? I feel stuck on this because I feel like the Lord's wanting to get somebody in their heart and say, no, no, that's you. He's talking to you. This is the foundation for your walk with God. I knew a guy that worked for me. And he was typical of a lot of ex-drug addicts that I'd seen. And he would go in these cycles where he'd be all for God. He'd be at every prayer meeting. He'd be at every church service. He would be tithing. He would be in the outreach. He'd be doing everything. And then he'd crash and burn and go back into drugs for a while. And then he'd come back up in those cycles. You know what I found out about those people that are unstable like that? It's not that they don't try hard enough. They don't have the right foundation they're building on. Instead of feeling the embrace of the Father saying, this is the thing that's going to sustain you. This is the thing that's going to motivate you. When I'd ask him how he was doing, he'd go, well, I'm doing real good now. I'm going to church. I'm paying tithe. I'm kind of like, oh, no, that's not doing good. Are you rooted and grounded in the love of the Father for you? Because that's the only thing that will hold you. See, if, if, you, if you have this, I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm beseeching you. I'm begging you. If this isn't a reality in your life, and this isn't the anchor point for you in the ups and downs of life, go there. Go there. Keep looking at the grace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ until you see it. But this is the only foundation that keeps you stable. Hear me, please hear me. People who turn, let, let, let me say it this way. People who, quote, fall away from the Lord, you don't do that easily if you have really tasted of his overwhelming embrace of your life. It's hard to do that. And you don't do that if you really realize what you deserve and what you got. People mad at God. I'm like, seriously, you actually said that out loud? <laughs> you're mad at God because you didn't get a good deal. Uh, seriously? You have a question you're going to ask the Lord when you see him. <laughs> really? That question is probably going to be, God, why did you ever 
to pay attention to if such a one as me. It's not going to be what you think. <laughs> Nobody's ever gotten a raw deal from God. Ever. Everybody's been lavished with abundant grace. Are you with me? Yes. All right. Two more little facets. I'm not going to labor on this. But I feel like the Lord wanted me to share these two. Okay. Overwhelming embrace is number one. Number two. Abundant fruit bearing. John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me. Abide. Abide in me. Stay hooked up with me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. You notice it didn't say try to be the branches? I'm the vine. Try to be a vine. Try to hook up to me. I'm the vine. Try to go. You are the branches. That means you're connected to the vine. That means there's life that flows from him into you for fruit bearing. Did you ever go out into an orange grove at night when it's real quiet? And you sit down there and you hear, ah! Ah! Say, what's that? The orange trees are trying to produce fruit. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of people that when you talk about fruit bearing in the Christian life, that's immediately their default. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You know how the fruit is produced in the orange tree? The same way it's produced in you. They're attached to life. And the sap that is in that vine flows into that little puny branch. And lo and behold, fruit grows. That's how it happens. That's how fruit is produced in the Christian life. It's by abiding. We cooperate with Him. We connect with Him. But we can't squeeze the fruit out. You can't squeeze the fruit out. Jesus makes the fruit happen in our lives because of the life that is in Him. And we're connected to Him. Hallelujah. And number three. Unbelievable destiny. All of these facets of the grace of God. Here I am saying I'm going to talk about the grace of God. This is like a, a you know, one grain of sand on the ocean. <laughs> right? This is going to be throughout all of eternity. This is, these are huge subjects. Unbelievable destiny. We read in chapter 2 of Ephesians and verse 6 that he raised us up together with him to be seated with him. And then look at Daniel with me. You, you, you have to see this. Daniel chapter 7. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. This is a vision that Daniel saw. And this is a prophecy of history. And this is coming down to the end times. And starting at verse 24, just to give you a little background, he's talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin. So history is, is wrapping up. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. Another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. <clears throat> Sounds like the language in Revelation, right? But the court will sit for judgment. <laughs> Father is going to call the enemy on to the, the scene in the court. And it's not going to go well. The court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Hallelujah. Then... <clears throat> Notice this, verse 27 is, is one of the most amazing verses in all of Bible. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. 
Did, did you expect that that should have said to Jesus? Read it again. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominion will serve and obey him. The kingdoms are given over to his people. He, he says, to, to the weakest and most broken and most disobedient of the seven churches in the letters to Revelation, Laodicea. Right? Even there, his great heart. Now listen to me. We're just about done. The father will definitely discipline his children out of love, but it's always for good. Look, the church in Laodicea was in pretty bad shape. They were blind, naked, wretched, poor, miserable, right? It wasn't good. It wasn't a good scenario. But even there, Jesus said to them, those whom I I chase it. Therefore, be diligent and repent. Because here's what I want to do for you. He who overcomes will sit with me on my throne and rule the nations. You believe in this? Are you believing this? We've got we, we to gotta talk about it for, for a long time. I, I'm going to close with this. This is back on point number two, but I want to read it because I feel like there's something in it for us. Who knows who Hudson Taylor was? Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China in the mid to late 1800s. He went to China when it was unevangelized. He ended up starting a ministry called the China Inland Mission. And, and they struggled greatly there. They suffered tremendously going in there, you can imagine, breaking into China where it had never been evangelized. And Hudson Taylor struggled, and he cried out to God, both for his own personal holiness and for just his ability to endure what they were having to go through. And he had the pressure of running this whole organization, and it was hard. It was really hard. Here's what he wrote, and here's the revelation. And I want you to listen to some key phrases here, because this applies to us. I, we can talk about this, and I can talk about this forever and ever and ever. We can be whole and yada yada. It doesn't, doesn't connect and change our lives. But we have to see it. We have to see it. This is what Paul prayed in Ephesians 1.18 where he said, I pray that you would know what is the riches of his inheritance in the saints is by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The Holy Spirit has to make the scales fall from our eyes, and we actually see it. So here's Hudson Taylor. He's totally sold out missionary, gave up everything. He's going over to China. He's got this group that he's working with. And he's struggling mightily. When my agony of soul was at its height, a sentence in a letter from a dear friend was used to remove the scales from my eyes. And the Spirit of God revealed to me the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. As I read, I saw it all. I looked to Jesus and I saw. And when I saw, oh, how joy flowed. He said, I will never leave you. I saw not only that Jesus will never leave me, but that I'm a member of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. The vine is not the root merely, but all. Root, stem, branches, twigs, leaves, flowers, fruit. And Jesus is not that alone. He's the soil, the sunshine, the air, the, the showers, and 10,000 times more than we have ever dreamed or wished for. Oh, the joy of seeing this truth. Did you notice how many times he said, I saw the scales fall from my eyes, the joy of seeing? Here was a guy who studied the Bible every day. You think he didn't know John 15? He had just, in fact, when you do the research, he had just read a whole series of articles by this guy talking about abiding in Christ. And it didn't affect him. He was still struggling. This is interesting. But you know what? He kept looking. Yes. He just kept gazing. He just kept looking. And finally, his eyes opened. The scales fell off. Hey, oh my gosh. I am the branch. He is the vine. We are attached. His life does flow in me. Wow. His life was changed. The next year, his wife died. Two of his children died all within six months. During his tenure over 
China Inland Mission. The Boxer Rebellion happened in China where the Chinese arose up and drove all the foreigners out and slaughtered them. He lost 58 of his missionaries and 21 of their children. He had to lead them on through that. The way that they did mission then was they had to sign an agreement that they would never ask for funds, ever. Only God. That's, that's how they did it. And here's the testimony of people that were closest to him and that knew him. From that day, when the scales fell from his eyes, he stood under that Niagara Falls. And he saw his connection with Jesus and the grace of God that was available to him and flowing to him. He never worried. He was never anxious. I'm just telling you. That's incredible. Do you think there's any more for you, maybe, in this connection to the body? Do you think that there's any more of this grace of God that can work in your life? It's amazing. So I just submit to you, we're talking about the beauty of the grace of God. I'm just putting out a big picture that this is an ocean. This is overwhelming. And there is so much there. Go after it. Go after it.